Hi, my name is Maylee Hay. I'm Harrison Schmachtenberger. And we will be presenting on the need for pit latrine assistance. So the problem that we're looking at is physically disabled people using a pit latrine. And for those of you who don't know, the pit latrine is pictured here in the middle. It's a simple hole in the ground that's used in place of a toilet in parts of the developing world. And so to use this, you need to squat and remain squatting while you relieve yourself. And so you can imagine just how difficult or impossible it is for someone like this, who's physically disabled, to use the pit latrine in a safe and dignified manner. So there's two parts to our problem. The first is sanitation and the second is physically disabled. So let's look at sanitation. In the world, there are 2.5 billion people that lack access to improved sanitation and 1 billion people practice open defecation. So the executive director of UNICEF has stressed the value that toilets provide and the United Nations has said that improving sanitation is as critical as clean drinking water is to improving global health and sanitation. So this map shows proportions of the world that lack access to improved sanitation. And you'll notice in Sub-Saharan Africa, the population is extremely large, bordering 70%, which translates to hundreds of millions of people lacking access to improved sanitation. So the second part we need to talk about are those with physical disabilities. First, there's those who've been injured in war. So this shows that people across the world have been affected by war as recently as 2015. The second group we want to talk about is those who've been affected by landmines. And this shows that landmines have caused casualties in much of the world as recently as 2010. This problem persists today. The third group we want to talk about is the elderly. By 2050, it's estimated there will be two billion elderly people on this planet. As we've heard, uh, with improvements in life expectancy, this proportion will only grow as time goes on. The last group are those who've been debilitated by diseases or rendered without the full use of their legs. So to really understand this issue, we wanted to <coughs> combine these problems, and we're looking at approximately 375 million people worldwide who lack access to improved sanitation as well as have physical disabilities. So to narrow the scope and really get into the depth of this problem, we wanted to focus on one country in particular, <clears throat> and that was Uganda. Why Uganda? Because of Margaret Oretsch. She was being recognized as a woman peacemaker at our university, and she shared her story of how she was on her way home for Christmas to visit her family when the bus that she was on ran over and detonated a landmine. She lost the lower half of her right leg, but nevertheless, she persisted. And she said that after her convalescence, the hardest part about adjusting to life with a handicap was using the pit latrine. So in Uganda, there's an overwhelmingly large disabled population. Approximately 19% of all Ugandans have some form of disability, and of that 19%, 34% have physical disabilities. So that puts over 2.4 million Ugandans living with physical disabilities. And this is in large part due to the prevalence of landmines, because landmines are not designed to kill, they're designed to maim. And in Uganda, 80% of all landmine casualties are actually civilians, non-combatants. <clears throat> so Uganda's been trapped in a crippling cycle of this war creating disability, this disability feeding the poverty, and then poverty creating more conflict. When we take a closer look at this history of war, we see that in the 1970s there was Idi Amin, whose military rule led to the death of hundreds of thousands of people, and more recently than that was the Lord's Resistance Army's incursions into Uganda led by Joseph Kony which has been known as one of the longest ongoing conflicts in African history. So what also contributes to this problem are some social and cultural factors. So in Uganda, in comparing to most parts of the world, whereas we would say with a family of five children where one of them is disabled, in Uganda they will say we have four children and one disabled. They're separated, excluded from the family. Also, there are stigmas surrounding the pit latrine. As in most parts of the world, it's very unacceptable to talk about what you do in the bathroom. That holds true in Uganda as well. And also, in parts of the developing world, squatting in a shared facility is seen as cleaner than using a sitting toilet where someone else's butt has been. Makes sense. So lastly, I want to touch on some of the economic and political factors that are kind of leading to this problem as well. And in a country where the median income for someone who's not disabled is 39 US dollars per month, you can imagine how difficult it is for someone who has trouble finding employment due to their limitations to afford a personal solution to this problem. And then you might ask what the government is doing about this. And the answer is really not that much because in 2016, the Ugandan government allocated less than $300,000 for all vulnerable groups in Uganda, which includes the disabled but also the elderly, 
which translates to less than five US cents per disabled person on these programs. I'm gonna hand it over to Maylee now. Thank you. So we are going to take a look at the current solution landscape. Um, first, the solutions in the developing world that exist. There are several patents within the United States uh, that range from camping devices, uh, latrine aids, to walkers with built-in toilet seats. There are also uh, designs, quick fixes within Uganda. The first picture here shows the solution that Margaret's father made for her when she came back from the hospital. The second solution is uh, just a permanent solution over the pit latrine. And then the third picture is one that we took when we visited a children's hospital in Embrara. Some government efforts would include the Ministry of Health, but right now all of their resources are being spent towards infectious disease, so zero dollars are being spent on disabled programs. And then there's also the National Council for the Disabled, and they're allocated $145,000 by the Ugandan government in order to create programs for seven million disabled people in the country. But those include both programs for physically disabled and mentally disabled. And then there are also um, some other non-governmental organizations that are working towards finding solutions to similar problems. They include uh, the free wheelchair mission, which is creating uh, wheelchairs from old bike parts to help people get around uh, low-cost mobility devices. There's also Soil, which is based out of Haiti, and they create eco-friendly toilets to help with sanitation. And then there's also Toiletpreneurs, who creates uh, toilets on wheels to help those in India fight um, open defecation. So there exists a gap between these solutions where uh, the first world solutions are uh, too expensive and they are made of materials that are not easily available within the country that we're, the countries that we're talking about. Uh, the in-country solutions are very often unsanitary. Uh, they're not portable and they don't solve the problem of the person actually getting to the pit latrine independently in the first place. And non-governmental organizations each have a piece of the puzzle, but they don't solve the full problem uh, that we're looking at. So what could bridge this gap? Based on uh, what we have found, these design constraints would create uh, the most comprehensive solution to the problem that we're looking at. So it would be low cost, portable, easily manufacturable and made from locally available materials. It would help the individual get to the pit latrine, so serve a dual purpose as a mobility device, and most importantly, it would be socially acceptable. So here are some pictures of some of the devices that we have created, tested, iterated, um, and prototyped after we spent 17 days within Uganda talking to the community to fully understand the scope of the problem. So some lessons that we have learned. Any potential solution to this problem would need to have these three components. First, it would need to be simple. So if it's not easier than what they're already using, then it won't be used by the population we're trying to help. Uh, it must be resilient, or the organization behind the solution must understand that there's no quick fix to this problem. Things like this, it takes a long time and a long-term plan in order to solve. And finally, it must include indigenous involvement. So the beneficiaries of the project must be included in the entire process of finding a solution. Uh, for us, we've been in contact with several organizations on ground in Uganda in constant communication so that we can make sure that maybe some of the solutions that we're trying out are actually solving their problem. And we see a huge benefit here within some of these potential solutions because there's nobody who would resist a solution to this. So there's nobody who's benefiting from the status quo. Um, and unlike other projects where, like child labor or sex trafficking where there's somebody benefiting, uh, there's nobody who's going to oppose a solution to this. So based on our findings, these are the levers of change that we see would make the biggest impact the, and um, also be sustainable. So first is empowerment. This lever of change would help create financial and physical independence. Breakdown of the negative stigma is the second lever of change that would, um, so you can't find a solution if you can't talk about it first. So we're trying to break down that negative stigma of talking about the problem of unsanitary use of the pit latrines. And finally, uh, restoration of dignity is the last lever of change. When people feel empowered and dignified and respected, peace can be achieved. So as Angela Merkel said, um, we, when it comes to human dignity, we cannot make compromises.
Wonderful San Diego. So over to our judges. Um, thank you for your presentation. My question is in regards to the social stigma around disability. Um, how does uh, one of your proposed solutions, which is the design of that kind of product, um, combat the social stigma? Sure. Do you want to take it? Sure. So, yeah, so what we really wanted to investigate and address was the fact that as a disabled person is seen as dependent, is that often they'll have to, have to ask people they know to carry them into the pit latrine. So if we can enable someone, or a solution can enable a disabled person to independently use the pit latrine, we're kind of mitigating that stigma and re like reducing the fact they're self or not self-reliant. So, you know, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, so one of the findings when we were in Uganda was that it was actually cheaper to hire somebody to carry, let's say, in this case it was somebody's grandma around and help them use the pit latrine than actually buy a device to, to help them. So if you can imagine somebody holding you up while you're trying to use the restroom, that's, uh, that really takes away a lot of dignity. So And... and um, that also contributes to the stigma that they're seen as a burden. Also, I would like to add that we that there can be an economic plan implemented with a solution where uh, the creation of these devices by the disabled themselves will also create um, a, an economy around it where then they can also achieve financial independence. And in those ways, they're fighting the stigma that those with disabilities are a burden. Second question. Uh, just for clarification, now you mentioned there was, although not enough, some money that was um, funded, the, the government fund into um, disability rights or issues, but where is that money going? That's a super good question. We wish we knew, but um, actually what happens is that there's been many uh, laws passed by uh, global organizations like United Nations that kind of force developing countries to institu or institute past laws that pro promote disabled uh, acceptability and like kind of inclusion, but none of those laws are enforced. So the National Council for the Disabled was formed, um, and when I actually looked through the budget, much of the money actually went to salaries. So paying the people on the council who are not actually disabled to advise the disabled on programs that could be available for them. So most of the money is actually towards salaries for staffing that council, unfortunately. Thank you very much.